the responsibility. I am not yet on the faculty at UNO, so I do not have that button. Ah. Okay, so welcome to the Common Metrics Working Group for June 27th. Um, so what we have on the agenda for today, since we worked on the organizational affiliation metrics for the last couple of weeks, um, and we got those put into the into the stuff for the release, and I think everything's everything's good with those. I thought maybe we would uh, take a look at the other other metrics that we have. Maybe we can start some work on those for the next release. Which we I don't know if we've ever decided if we're doing it twice a year or once a year. That's hmm. the, the releases. Yes. I don't think they should be less than once a year, and I would be inclined to recommend, well, given the cycle of review, um, I was going to say every three months, but maybe every four months. I, I think more frequently than twice a year is important because the people who are doing this work in industry, they're moving very fast. And, and I think maybe the current review period is longer simply because we're learning how to do a review period. Mm -hmm. And now that we are going to learn that maybe I think three times a year seems like something that will look relevant and continuously relevant in the eyes of industry people who are looking at this. And I think less than that will just make us look like an academic project that's plodding along. Okay. I mean, I, I think that and I'm not like, you could disagree with me. Like I oh. saw a very authoritative white manny there. You did. We were all silent I, after I that. Can, <laughs> I can be wrong. <laughs> I, I would say at least every six months. Um, every three months sounds daunting to me right now because we haven't even figured out the process, but I suspect it'll get easier and easier once we sort of figure out it what should. it is that we're trying, trying to do. Um, yeah, but I think at least every every six months. Twice a year would correspond with the chaos con events. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. So I would say at least that. Good old fashioned conference driven development. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. Hey, how's everyone doing? Good. Hey, John. Nice to see you. Yeah, good. Likewise. At least an image of your face when you were happy. Right now, you might be like crying in a beer, but right now you're <laughs> let's see. My video wasn't working in my previous call. I don't know if it's going to start working now. Yeah, probably. probably not. Videos. Probably not. Ugh. Silly Max. Okay. Um, John here. Maybe we can focus on the metric that he has been working on so much. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. Uh, it's first on the agenda, anyway. So, and we don't have, and we don't have Danny for the responsiveness metrics. So, I think we should start with start with geography, for sure. Um, does everybody have the doc? Well, of course, because you guys are awesome. I put it in the chat. Um, it's also in the meeting notice that somebody shared with me, so that helps. Cool. Um, were you not on the, the meeting invite or? No, I think I'm, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm oh yeah, you are. Okay. So they have it. Cool. Um, all right. So the, who wants to take notes? I can take notes. Okay. You can both take notes. Everyone can take notes. Um, so the note, the agenda has a link to the issue, which has a link to the, um, Google Drive folder, which has the three, the three metrics. Um, John, do you want to do you want to just drive some of this? I mean, we thought. Uh, so let me back up a little bit. Um, I was thinking this could be just sort of a working meeting to work on the geography metrics or the okay. responsiveness metrics. Um, so if you want to just kind of, kind of drive that as you as you see fit, we can start with with whichever ones you want. Yeah, we could take a, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's, that sounds good to me. Yeah, let's, uh, I'm, I'm willing to be the, the first one here and uh, dig into the geography metrics. Um, 
So I guess looking at their three ducks, and basically I want to pay the biggest thanks to, to Matt because he did all of the hard work of lining this up here and kind of dropped most of the notes. And then I think I went and like made a couple of minor edits. Um, so um, big kudos to him for, for all of that. <laughs> no <hard problem>. <laughs> um, so yeah, I tried to fill in here and I guess a lot of the, I mean, I, I, all these here, I, I kind of was struggling a little bit on three, four, five, and six, um, just because I just wasn't, I, I wasn't as sure is that something we're pointing to that's existing or whether it's something we should be creating a mock-up of. So I, I wasn't as sort of familiar with that. And um, so if, if anybody has great ideas there, um, that would be really helpful. Um, but I guess looking at like the employer country one here, um, you know, description, fairly self-explanatory. Just, we're just trying to figure out where the, main location headquarters um, of the organization that's employing the contributor if we know the contributor is participating on behalf of their employer. Um, the use cases around that um, is just that they want to understand not only the global makeup of the contributing organization and the organizational supporters who are kind of looking at different regions. And then I think probably the big one is being able to put differentiation between somebody who's doing their own time participation or participating um, through their employer here. Um, so just, you know, trying to, trying to see sort of what that looks like of, of what the main drive is. Um, so I will pause there. Um, thoughts, comments, um, and if anybody has ideas on fil sample filters, validation, um, implementation, what's known out there, that would be helpful because I was not as familiar with that part. How would we measure this? Would this be self-reported? Um, or, well, I guess I think, if, we, if we know the organizational, sorry, I'm just going to, I guess I'm talking out loud. Go uh, for it. I'm talking out loud, thinking out loud. Um, <laughs> I always talk out loud. Um, I guess if we know the organizational affiliation of an employee, there are probably databases where you can get the organization's corporate headquarters location. How would yeah. we get that? I guess maybe it's just a general question. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking that's probably going to be the biggest is like if, if you're able to match somebody you know, to an employer. Um, yeah, you could probably cross reference against where people are, are headquartered, you know, you know, you know, based on maybe like the domain name and the email address. I mean, you might run into kind of goofinesses there that like some people will use like their main personal GitHub account for all their contributing. Yeah. So that could be a little bit shaky. Um, if projects are using DCO sign off, sometimes it's a little bit cleaner because sometimes people are a little bit better about using that to match or if there's like a CLA, but um, I so think it's one, a, go ahead. One suggestion I have, and it kind of came to me while I was working on the Linux badging risk metrics is, so this might be a case, there's two possible ways that we're handling this in Augur, but I think they're relevant to the definition of the metric. In the case of the risk, in the case of the Linux badging program, there are 270 pieces of this data, like discrete fields that are returned. And I'd say of those, about 170 of them are either, they can be either scanned by a tool developed by the Linux Foundation, or if that tool doesn't find it, then they can be entered by a person who's filling out the badging form. So what I said in my email, and I think is, I might be the wrong language, but those are, they could be the same data, but they could have two different types of evidence supporting the claim. So, so that's one, 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 one is we could have just a evidence type be a piece of information that's required for the contributor metric country so that you could have six Sean Goggins that you identified using six different um, pieces of parts of evidence, or they could all point to the same person but probably each identification of me from a discrete repository, issue tracker, whatever, is going to, it's either going to be, I said it was me or a machine program of some kind said it was me. 
Um, if we're going to do it on a large scale, the other thing we do at the end of every auger table is we say tool version and tool source. Um, so that the provenance of the data that's captured is, is always there. Now, I think for some kinds of information in chaos, that's not relevant, but I think when it comes to contributor country, I think we're never going to solve the problem of, well, where did it come from? So part of the metric might be letting people know where it came from and then they can make their own assessment of how to treat that. The other thing that I think is going to be really important with metrics like, like this one is that I think we actually need to decouple the organizational affiliation metric from the um, things like employer country, for example, because I think maybe we need yeah. to assume that we have an organizational affiliation metric that is used as kind of a dependency mm -hmm. for this metric. Because otherwise, what we'll end up doing is we'll end up redefining organizational affiliation and how we do it when we do all of these metrics, anything yeah. that has to do with company, um, company or employer. I think they're two different things. I think yeah. where I am, yeah, I agree. You're in England. I, don't, I have no idea if the country that you work for is also in England. Mm -hmm. Is it headquartered there? Uh, no, I work for Pivotal. They're headquartered in San Francisco. So, Although our EMEA headquarters are in London, so. Okay. But EMEA is a fully owned subsidiary of yep. San Francisco. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think contributor country, I, yeah, I think we have to, I assume it could be, be different than contributor organization. Like when I think about those two things, I think of them as different pieces of information. John, can you say your thing again? I didn't totally track what you were getting at. Uh, yeah. Just now? Or Don? You said Don. Don. Oh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so in order to decide what the um, employer country is for a contributor, you have to know that contributor's employer before you can determine the country. Um, okay. So yep. I see as a dependency that we understand organizational affiliation for that contributor, because if we don't just make organizational affiliation a dependency, We'll end up redefining it in every metric that talks about who who your employer is. I understand. Okay. Does that make sense, Sean? You look yeah. puzzled. Yeah. No. No. I'm. I'm. I'm now following it. I'm okay. now. There was. A, I think there was a piece actually that I didn't recognize that I didn't understand that you clarified just Okay. Now. Yeah. yeah, because we're gonna have like we're gonna, there are gonna be lots of stuff that's based on employer throughout the metrics, not just for for this working group, for but for lots of others. And so I think we just need to be careful that some of these, what I would call kind of core metrics, like like organizational affiliation, that we're not redefining it as a subset of the other metrics that use organizational affiliation as a dependency. Right, because this is the first conversation I've heard where two metrics would be related like that mm -hmm. across all working groups. I think every other time the metrics have been relatively independent okay. from one another. So. We do have some composite metrics in the uh, uh, evolution work group. Okay. And I, I think there may be some at risk as well. Okay. What do you think, John, since you're the one working on this metric, does that, does that sort of make sense? I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 no, I mean, I mean, I, th I mean, I think that's, you know, with anything in order to have rational, um, you know, comparisons across data, like you have to have a consistent definition. Otherwise, you're just going to have things, you know, if you have one group that's looking at something. Yeah, and I think your example of Pivotal is a very, very interesting one, right? I mean, would you be considered working out of a country out of the UK? Or would your organization be out of the US? I mean, I think that's sort of the bottom line question here. Um, and I'm sure there could be, and then how do you equally apply that to, oh, geez, I'm just trying to think here. I mean, this isn't a great example, but let's say a company like, um, IBM, for example, you know, and you're working for Red Hat, um, are you working for a company based out of, uh, Raleigh or are you working for a company that's based out of New York state? 
Um, so I, I think things can get really, really shaky there. And I'm sure there's probably some, some variance of terms, but I think the bigger picture, which I agree with is let's figure out, like, let's define what organization is and make sure we do it within the context that companies can have multiple business units within them. And then what ends up being the demarcation to say that I'm working for, I, I'm working for this company whose primary headquarters is in A versus I'm working for a business unit of this company whose primary headquarters is in B. And for the people who work at home, is it is is it the office that they report to that becomes their location? Yeah, that's another funky one, right? I mean, people ask me where I work, and I'd like I work out of the second Linux Foundation Ohio office, um, and. Uh, and and that's kind of, but our headquarters is in San Francisco. And meanwhile, I've only been there about four times ever. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, so I, that's, a, that's actually a really good question of like how home, but I mean, but do you work from home? Cause I've met a lot. Yes, of I do work from home. You work from home. Yeah. I've worked from home for almost a decade now. We're actually over a decade. Like I, um, I know one who works in Mexico and I know his company doesn't. Head right. And I, th and I think this is what this is actually trying to capture here. Right. Is kind of those people that are working from, disparate locations mm -hmm. and I mean because that's when I was thinking about this metric that's sort of what I was going after is is somebody contributing based upon you know them being I'm you know I'm in Mexico and I'm contributing to this project am I contributing because I'm interested in it or contribute because I'm employed by a company in the United States that is um, and then furthermore when you get when you maybe cross references around sort of like the commit hours you know, am I working on this during my, during, you know, am I moonlighting on this because I'm trying to match up to my, you know, coworkers that might be stateside? Or am I working on this moonlighting because I'm nocturnal and I just, I just do that because, right? Um, so I think, I mean, that might also be a good way to think about as we're trying to put these together is like, what are the, what are the answers that we're trying to solve? And I think that ends up to me being the main one is that that exact say, that exact thing of I am a con you know I am either a contractor or working out of my house. Um, you know, am I doing this because I want to? Well, I guess we all do it because we want to. But I doing this out of my own time, or am I doing this because my employer, you know, out of my employee time? And is that sort of the reason why there's a shift in hours, or a shift in you know where I'm at, or you know why why we all of a sudden have like 30 people participating from Mexico? It's not because Mexico is all of a sudden the hotbed. It's because this company just outsourced out to 30 people in Mexico. So I think one of the things you just said is we need to understand the questions we're trying to answer, and maybe that is uh, a good next step to collect all of the questions that we have about. Um, geographic diversity or that we can answer with geographic diversity um, and then figure out how the metrics can answer them and that has worked really well with organizational diversity where we just sat down okay what are all the questions that we yeah have? If, if I was to think about this the, as you listening to the conversation I think there are two metrics here one is what office of a large corporation is a person reporting into? Because I think that's interesting in and of itself. But I think also knowing if we can find out where is that person physically located, for, you know, regardless of their company affiliation, that's also interesting because chances are if I'm working in Mexico and I change jobs, I'm probably not moving. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that's why the contributor country and contributor employee country are two separate metrics. Yeah, they are. So oh, yeah. I have two things. Were they already two separate metrics and I just caught up? Yes. <laughs> yes. <All right. laughs> Great. Thank you for educating me. It's okay. Full circle. <laughs> so I do. So one's a comment. I have one comment and one question. So one earlier, Sean had mentioned the idea of um, kind of the the declared versus concluded. And so I think there's something to be said here. Um, we could have say a, a country that's declared based on tooling or based on some, some um, automated way to determine it, but it's, 
it's really what's not concluded. So there might be something to be said there. Well, and I, and I think compared and concluded, concluded are the two pieces of information in the DUSOX tool. And I think those are very useful. Yeah, so right, I was thinking SPDX uses this for licenses. Mm -hmm. So they have, they have what are declared licenses, like what are, what's what, those are the licenses that the tooling found. Right. The concluded licenses are those that the people actually say that's, that's correct. So, so they might be the same, but they might actually be different. And, and I guess, I think in the case of where I'm located or, or in some other metrics, I, I think the, I'm trying to think if there's, like I may have so the evidence, like I, can think of, I can think of three evidence types of where I live in particular. Like you can look at a phone book, you could find it on the internet. Uh, I could tell you, you could scan it based on my, like I know there's some work being done scanning location based on when the time, what, what time of day my contributions are and what times of day the people with whom I work on the same things are. So I think there's going to end up being a host of algorithms that sort of make these statements. Yeah, these are the concluded. Right. right. Sorry, so, these, are the these are the declared. Right. So there could be like, or the, the, or the tool identified, there could be more than three. Mm -hmm. In this case, in this case, and so something like data source for the claim um, may be something we want to include as a. I don't know if that's a filter to our way of thinking, or right. maybe that's an implementation deal. Like maybe I have spent too much time in the detail. If, if if we go down this route of how to structure a declared right. It's, it's not authoritative. It's just a, a best guess based on the data that we have, whatever that composite data is. Right. Um, the second thing that I was going to bring up was, is it important to have country or would there be any value in having like geographic region? Because, you know, the UN defines regions, the WHO defines regions. Is country critical? That is an interesting question. I mean, I, I guess I was, because I think we'd also had a discussion about this of trying to understand, like, what is the right grouping? Do we want to go in time zones? Do we want to go in regions? Do we want to get really granular and get to, yeah. like, very well, countries, close look Countries out? are pretty granular. The, it is. It the is. The more specific we can be, the more ability we have to aggregate up and down. Yeah. But we shouldn't be so specific that we're unlikely to get reliable information at that level of specificity, right? So, John, do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. no. The so country might be right. Like, I would love, I would love like geo. I would like to have geolocation on all the people. <laughs> but, but uh, probably as they're committing. By the way, you know, as they're like walking around their house and stuff, yeah. right? <laughs> That's probably that's gonna that's gonna feel. Don's like, committing you know, a lot for Kim committing a lot from her porch today. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> Are those Are they sitting next to the coffee machine or in front of the TV? Yeah. <laughs> Are we really talking about two different questions here, though? Is it like oh. corporate location? Yeah. Uh, corporate headquarters location, because mm -hmm. region would work for a company that is a, a multinational, for example. My, mine was more about trying to move the metric forward and what's the, the lowest level of detail that we can provide that's useful. So obviously if we ask for what planet you're on, super not helpful. Um, if we for ask now. for now, if we ask what hemisphere you're on, more useful than planet, but maybe still not useful enough. If we ask Region, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, Region. yeah, no, it's, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I guess the way I'd be looking at this also, so if I had this data, what would I do? And right. you know, if, if, you know, there's probably a lot of reasons you could have it. You know, one could be um, of just trying to, I mean, one could be just informational, but the other, you know, in terms of an action could be, what if I am looking at places to start meetups for my project? Um, if I had Europe as a region, that's very broad. If I had France, 
that helps narrow it down of, hey, maybe there's a concentration of people in France here. Do we do a Paris meet or do a Paris event or something like that? So I guess that's how I was thinking about it. Yeah, so I guess then, right. And, and the question then is, is, is what's the level, the highest level of granularity that's useful? Because that might be the easier thing to get first. So. I mean, or maybe you just dive right into country. Maybe country is the place to go. Maybe that's the the highest level that means something. And anyway, if we asked if we asked time zone, that that might prove useful and less less it must re it might reveal less information. Um, I'm not saying it's probably it's much coarser than country. Country would be great. I think it's. I almost wonder if we should if we should call this metric contributor employee location. Um, and then just sort of be broad on like what what you're collecting by location. Like, do you want to get down? Like, do you want to collect down at like the city level, or are you okay with the country level or the region level? Yeah, because for some, you know, for some communities, especially smaller ones, you might have more granular location data than country. Um, and, and country is great for places like Europe, but if you just say U.S., that doesn't tell me much about where that person's located. That's a huge country. Same thing with Canada, Russia, China. Um, where, you know, something like that, city or, you know, region, state, province, whatever they call them in those places. Um, might be better. Yeah. yeah I, don't know. I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, and I hard. guess it's asked sort of the larger question here is like, is, is the goal here for just internal project data, like for you to know about your own, or are you also going to be using this as a cross reference against other projects as well? And you could argue if that's the case, you might want to have some uniformity. If it's just singular project, I mean, pick whatever you want. I mean, I think if it's an internal database, those folks are likely to be able to get more qual high quality information. If yeah. it's something that we want to build for the community, then we probably will get less information with less certainty, right? Yeah, and that's a good point about comparing across projects as well. Yeah. Like we want to be careful about comparing across projects that have different information sources. Yeah. 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 This, this I'm can... not saying don't do it, but that's where recording the provenance of where we got that data, we can also show in any kind of a tool, tooling based system, uh, you know, what percentage of the data comes from which type of source, um, which will be a signal of confidence. Would a would maybe a way to kind of move this forward is I like the idea of location, but put in here a recommendation of what granularity, you know, of, of probably a, a recommendation of granularity, but then leave it open to the project of what level they're up to capturing. Or is that? I would like to. I mean, my ideal universe is that I'd like to specify. Oh, me too. Me well, too. Can that be a filter? I mean, could this be part of the metric definition? There's a filter part. Sample filter. So the filter would be: I want to filter by planet, or I want to filter by region, or I want to filter by country. I think it, the difference between this and a filter is it's more about provenance and um, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe this is when we probably should chew on a little bit of just this level. I mean, I guess if, if we would all step away here and say, let's, go away i mean i think we're all in agreement here that the term country as opposed as a part of the metric we could change with location and even if the the main drive would be to get at the country level um 
everything under the use case is sort of the same. Like, I don't, I don't see much changing in one or two there other than anywhere where it says country change to location. Is that a fair assessment? I think that's fair. And okay. I like your idea of giving a recommendation as part of the metric um, and then letting the projects or whoever implements them decide the granularity that they need. Yeah. Now, is the is the expectation here that tools makers would then go off and make something based upon this? Is that is that sort of the yes? And so, and then, and then <laughs> that's they where things get fun. Say, Thanks for all that conversation. This is impossible. So, <laughs> <laughs> <I'm gonna call. laughs> so, yeah. yeah, that's. I mean, that's what I'm just thinking about here. Is like because I mean, every time I see a tools maker that does any sort of visualiza visualization on con on on location, it tends to be like the the country heat map. Yep, I know what you're talking about. But I've uh, also seen the dots, which is sort of an equally thing of just if you really want to get pinpointed down from there. Yeah, I, I, well, again, I'm probably thinking about this too concretely as a person who's been building tools, but just we could use the field in a number of different ways. And I just think having as making part of the metric being that the granularity is specified that it's and I don't I guess maybe that's a filter. But I think maybe it's a piece of information that's required to produce this filter and could be easily provided. Like your location is X and the granularity level is Y. And it could be user defined or tool defined what granularity it is. Um, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we have an action item for Sean, which is not to build this thing. But right, to right. Just like sketch pad it out, you know, like yeah, kind of yeah. wireframe it and see what it would look like. Yeah, yeah. And what I think I'd wireframe is the the model of you know how you might store this data and its provenance, and then um, two examples. One example being uh, country, and the other example being um, maybe locale. So, for example. I don't want your geospatial coordinates, but maybe I'd like to know that you live in the state of Illinois or in, in I don't know what the equivalents are in India, but in in Canada, they're province. Um, yeah. And then I guess the next level of granularity would be city. And I, I don't know that we'd ever want to get beyond that level, right? Because then that, that gets to the, I mean, beyond country, we might be already asking for things that are creepy, but companies are going to have exact mailing addresses and they may in fact want to use that information in an internal system. Yeah. I mean, so that also, as I'm thinking about this is two different things here, like employer country, like that's public information. Like that's relatively straightforward to get individuals. You know, now all of a sudden, does that, do we cross into privacy areas? Hmm. For individuals who work for a company, they have to give their address as a matter of tax law and I think every country. So there, I think you're fine. I don't, I don't think that the privacy laws affect. But I guess, but I guess my point is like, what if, so what if this is like a, a project that's not hosted by, you know, the company um, and all of these individuals are participating um, you know, even through their company there, are they still in the position to like, is there privacy concerns of them effectively sharing their look, their location information with um, a third party like that, that needs to be dealt with? Like, is this something that can be like, com company is like a, pub a publicly crawlable thing. Individuals, I think that could be, I could see some privacy things of how to handle that data. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. That, that. Yeah. If it's an individual who doesn't work for a company, then we there's the assumption. That, for example, Petergia makes the assumption that they are um, compliant. They have to comply with GDPR. Uh, there are, but there are in fact exceptions for GitHub specifically and the software, the open source software community specifically in GDPR. And those same exceptions look like they're going to end up in the California laws. Um, 
I haven't read this myself. I've been talking with Don Marty at Mozilla about, about this. So I'm not saying that we go out there and wave a flag and say, ha ha, we're exempt, but um, I don't think we are in line for punishment if, if we, without the intent of revealing in personal information, make that available. And the, the specific case that Don and I talked about was the storage of uh, email addresses in Git repositories. Mm -hmm. that, that that in fact, that removing that would have a significant detrimental effect on the way that all software version control works. And so that's why that exemption exists. Um, and that is how, in fact, principally how we identify individual people, right? Right. So I guess if we then started tracking their location, I'm talking out loud. <laughs> um, we probably do need to gain some sort of consent for yeah. that. One, one, je, je, Matt, should I talk about some of the other things that we've talked about before with regards to ways of protecting anonymity while still capturing location data? Like what? Well, Hyperledger Indy. So yes, because I- Yeah, yeah, so Hyperledger Indy is one technology that would enable us to have a, a canonical provider, which could be the project or it could be the Linux Foundation, it could be GitHub, who has that information. And an individual could log into any other system that federated with the owner of your personal data, sort of they call it the authoritative provider. So my tax records, I, the IRS is the authoritative provider of that information and I can use whatever credentials I have there to log into TurboTax. And then me, I can decide how much of that information that the IRS has, I give to TurboTax. Uh, and TurboTax actually well, doesn't we, ever have to know who I am. Are we on target? What are we, I'm losing a little track of what we're, what the question was. I think the question was, do if we store personally identifiable information for people who do not work for companies, I see. Okay. what risks does that create for us? Or what are the things that we should be careful about or talk about or include in the way we describe this? I don't think we're, is, is a tool storing that, yeah, I guess. Yeah. I can store a lot of information that the, the GDPR probably would prohibit me from storing. Well, I mean, it's it's not just it's just the handling of it. Like a project's going to have to get it. like the tooling. The, whoever is administering the tool that's capturing this is going to have to deal with GDPR or any sort of privacy regulation. Um, so we probably should also be careful, saying it's not like us on this phone. It's not like somebody's going to come sue us. It's the the tool vendor, um, which is going to be the one, and probably the per well, actually, the person who's implementing the tool. So right. I think that's sort of the consideration there. Right. Yeah, I would think it would be the person implementing the tool. Is that yeah. right? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. In all likelihood, I... Which, I, I mean, I don't know how much, like, really, I mean, I've no, had this come up when I've talked with projects before. Um, I mean, I don't know how much, I, I don't know where tools sit in collecting PII um, from people. Like, and what their policy is, is on that and your right to be forgotten and all of those sort of nuances and stuff there. Maybe that's something the tool vendors are already dealing with. I think for the most part, open source developers don't want to be forgotten. They want to parade. You would think that. <laughs> um, you've never had somebody that wants to invoke that. GDPR and their GitHub commits and you have to explain to them you can't erase that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I never have had that experience. That, that sounds like a difficult person finding ways to be difficult. Yeah, uh, this, this is why the DCO actually comes in really handy because it, it yeah. it's, by the way, you agreed to this before, but anyways. Um, yeah, my yeah. favorite is I accidentally sent something confidential to the public open source mailing list for X project. Can you delete it for me? Uh. <laughs> Not how That's email the works. Email doesn't work that way. Yeah. yeah. You, that. <laughs> you must be new here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> On the internet. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I just don't, like, I, I am not, and I don't know if there's people, like, yeah. I think there is, I guess, sort of the summary of this whole thing is there are to probably comply, not necessarily with the employee country, but I think 
the if we look at contributor country, there's a degree of PII that's going to have to be collected. Um, that all said, what is do tool vendors already take responsibility on collecting PII or not? And you know, put disclosures in there and our open source communities that are housing this data, do they have the right things in place? And I don't even know, like I, mean, I don't know if that's a I don't like, know if that's something that Chaos has ever crossed before or not. Like GitHub's a big player in GitLab and, and they have big enough honeypots that I'm pretty sure their lawyers keep them compliant with all the legal stuff. Yeah. It, it's like it's like people like like Augur or Biturgia, where we're just out there trying to do the best we can, helping open source projects that if we, you know, uh, hypothetically, if we step in the wrong poo, we have trouble we can't afford to defend ourselves against, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think probably in the case of GitHub, they probably, you, there, there's probably a number of disclaimers that are saying yeah. you're opting into like 9,000 different things here. Yeah, um, and, if, and if I hired the lawyers, I would need to protect myself against all those things, I wouldn't have money to do anything else. True. True, true, true. So, yeah, I mean, I think it just ends up being a question if somebody's independent, if somebody is taking like a Baturgia or if they're wanting to roll their own thing in here, what is what is the responsibility that the tools vendors have for which maybe, and again, I don't know if that's something that is within the, the chaos recommendations to put definition on or not. I mean, is that something, I mean, I think that comes in the contributor country metric it's something to think about, but I don't, I, like, I, I don't, I don't know if that's something that this group is, should be defining, or if that's just sort of like an expectation of a tool vendors is like, no matter what, if you're collecting, if you're collecting, you know, statistical information on your project, you're probably going to collect PII. You certainly would hope you'd have the right thing of, you know, data storage and data privacy in place. I don't know, would I say it makes sense or if I just kind of like blown everyone's mind? Or if went too I, I wary understand, on I everyone? I understand all the questions. I think the answers <laughs> probably require a little bit of reflection. And if I if I develop a prototype sort of, uh, I would call it a, a sketch of these problems and share it, then that might help facilitate a discussion you know, at the next meeting. I think that's what Matt suggested a little while ago. And maybe that's what we should just do now. Okay. I think that makes sense. I don't know. What, you, what does everyone else think? Yeah, I agree. Sounds like a life over. All right. I'm going to just put a note in the contributor country doc of in the description of just saying that note this would most likely require collecting, um, you know, PII and, you know, the project and or tools vendors should be um, in a position to help comply with any relevant data privacy regulations or something like that. So Sean, I was trying to put your action item in the meeting minutes. How exactly do you want me to write it? Um, I would describe it as a data and user interface mockup of the contributor country information. And just so I'm clear, contributor country is the metric that is associated with organization or not associated with organization. The, con the the contributor employee country is associated with an organization. The contributor so we're looking country. at contributor country. So this is not associated with organization. Correct. Okay. I just want to make the different questions in each case. So yeah, the caveat you're raising, John, might be a caveat that we need to consider across a number of different metrics as well. Yeah, just thinking out loud. I think you're probably right. Yeah. And like I said, I just don't, I don't, I don't know if that's something that like chaos is in a position to deal with or if it's something like tool vendors should deal with. Yeah. Or we just put a disclaimer. Yeah. I don't think it would be in, I, don't, I think it'd be, I don't think it would, I think it would be helpful to tool vendors and suppliers as well as people who acquire open source software. If, if we maybe made some kind of separate statement or wrote a white paper, 
that described how we address these kinds of issues or ways to consider addressing these kinds of issues in open source broadly and not spend a ton of time on, time on them in each individual metric. Uh, part of that's disclaimer, but part of it can be education. Um, I don't know that we want to maintain, I don't know that we even want to reference things like GDPR or the new California law. I just think maybe we want to make a statement about the importance of user privacy and um, also the importance of uh, opting out of making all of your information private in the interest of sustaining a global development community, right? Like this, like we don't take generally take a position on anything, but this might be something where we decide to take a position. And it's not this working group. That's like the commit. That's the larger meeting. Well, I, just, I don't think it was in here. But I think it, I think all of this discussion raises this point, which is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. I just put a little note in the sample. I just put under sample implementation. I thought maybe that might be most appropriate. And I tried to keep it very broad in there of just saying that it would likely require collecting it and that the implementation should take into account take that into account that the collection of management and storing of PI should be done in accordance with any relevant data privacy regulations. So not referencing anything one out there, but just pointing out that you should pay attention to this. I think that's good. Okay. Cool. Um, so we spent a lot of time on that, but I think it was a good discussion. Um, yeah, and I think the other ones, the dis, the contributor country is a very similar one to employer country, you know, and I think we talked about that one at nauseum here. Um, an interesting one is the commit hours discussion. And so I think that was when we were trying to determine, like, when is the time period to collect, when's the time period that typically a contributor is contributing to a project. And I think coming back here, do you mean discrete commit time or are these estimates of labor hours invested? Yeah, so I think that's a good way. That's a great question in there as I was thinking about this. I think what we're trying to capture here and the use cases sort of talk about this is, um, you know, one, are we getting someone who's contributing as a part of their normal work day or are they kind of like a moonlighter like this is something they work on in the evening or, you know, out of work hours? Um, two is if a contributor is trying to work, you know, adjust to work alongside the community or if they're just working at whatever is the best convenience for them. Um, and then sort of three is see if the contributor is trying to align with maybe where their contributor where their main organization headquarters or team is, um, you know, versus not. And, and I don't think we were trying to get very overly detailed here like we don't need you know this person contributes you know on tuesdays from 8 59 a.m to 1 52 p.m and trying to get whatever but i think we were trying to at least capture trends and maybe hot spots of like when we would normally expect this person to be available or contributing that seems this one seems more approachable am i misreading this Seems like it'd be a little easier to understand yeah. than. And getting, but getting back at, at Sean's question, I think that calling it commit hours might be misleading because people yeah. might might misinterpret it to mean the number of hours it took to create a commit, as opposed to the timing or time period, which I think is what you're. Yeah. I, I, I I like that a lot better. Yeah, I think I was struggling with the title in there, and I oh. I like what you made. So like in the much in, in the value working group in an auger we we estimate the, um, the hours that an average developer would take to write a, a, a file. And these are based on like a giant pool of industry averages and lab studies from the seventies and eighties. They, they are not things that you can count on for planning a project. They are however useful for comparing relative investment. Yeah. Um, but this is, this is totally know. different. This is the time exactly. period. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think we should stay away. I, that's so I don't. I don't think it's. I don't mean it territorially, but I think the hours piece is something that value is working on, and so we should probably just. Cool. We don't need to solve that here, and it's not really the question we have. So are we talking about time zone then, mostly? No. This is just like actual like 
I mean, maybe this would be adjusted out for UTC or something just to make sure you're capturing. But this is just like, am I a 8 to 5 person? Am I a noon to 10 p.m. person? Am I a 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. person? You know, trying to capture that. And then I think the goal is that you could cross you could cross reference against other people in the project and just sort of be able to see, okay, this is what the typical, you know, th this is, this, this is when typically people are contributing. So you could also see, okay, if I know most of my contributors are contributing in this time period, maybe this is when I coordinate meetings or live discussions or, you know, IRC chats that we're all going to be on board with. Um, but I think then there's also some interesting secondary ones of just seeing like our, are people looking to adapt to the norms within the community or is this community very much more asynchronous and they're okay kind of working on the other things and then just also understanding like if if people are, are aligning with sort of where their organizations like if, if they're a remote team and you have like one person in like the philippines and other than us do they try to like overlap their time so they're working together or not yeah i see but i do think if you want if you want to get that that first use case outside of a normal work day, you probably need to take time zone into account. Yeah. So yeah. it's probably kind of a dependency or a sub metric or something, a subset. Um, well, I, would it would it be appropriate to this would be cross referenced against their location, or even employer location, so you could see whether. Um, so you could kind of have a hunch of like what a normal work day is. Hmm. Yeah, yeah I think here's, this, this gets also into a funny one mm -hmm. I could see really quickly here. Like, you know, what is the, the you're exactly right, Don. Like, what is the definition of a normal work day? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> As we all laugh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think of the people on this call, Matt German Prey has been the most successful at defining normal. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Well, no, <laughs> you, have, you have a strong routine that's that's that really kind of works for you in terms. I do. Of, yeah. Yeah. I aspire to that same level of routine. Um, I bet you didn't have it when you had twelve-year-old children. <laughs> I did. I did. You, I'm just saying that. Just <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're just I, making people feel bad. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I have, I, I have, I have in the past, believe it or not, but it's been a struggle. This, it's better now, anyway. Yeah. Well, that's that is an interesting. I mean, we could, we could get into philosophical, you know, discussions here. Are we saying a normal workday versus cultural norms, or are we saying a normal workday based upon your own patterns? Like, you know, do I? Do I get up and work from like, you know, six to eight, take kids to school, work again from like, you know, nine or 10 to three, pick kids up from school and then work, you know, a couple hours in the evening and that's normal. Are you spying on me? <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got four kids. Um, I, I, I understand. <laughs> All right. So we have two minutes left. So we should probably, probably wrap this up. I feel like we had lots of really really awesome discussions and it looks like we've documented at least a, a couple of action items. Um, is this something, John, you might kind of take off and, you know, do add some more details to the, to the docs and, and come back and we can put this on the agenda for a future meeting. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, I think okay. the big thing is, is just, I think on one and two there just to see if there's, there's any questions that I'm not hitting in there. Um, and then for some of these, yeah, I mean, I guess for like sample filter and visualization implementation, I mean, I, I guess that's just trying to find tools that are actually doing stuff like this and maybe throwing a couple screenshots so that that's sort of what y'all are after. I yeah, think the uh, screenshots of existing tools goes into number five, known implementations. Okay. In sample filter and visualization, it's about what are all the different ways we can dissect this data and look at it. So more of a description. Right. Yeah, it's more descriptive. Okay. And then sample implementation, uh, Sean, you have worked much more with it, but my understanding is there's a, some like a Jupyter notebook with a minimal implementation on how to collect or use the data. That is, yeah, so there are several ways of providing the example implementation. 
Um, a lot of the metrics that I've written use uh, relational data schema and SQL um, and or Python in an effort to make it clear to people who are thinking about the data and how they integrate it with other data. Mm -hmm. um, in other cases, and I, and I look at the Python stuff, I try to, I try to throw that direct people more towards the Augur implementation because that's where the Python is and um, that's where the current Python is. So I don't want to like have Python okay. in two places because then I have to update it in two places, um, which becomes a pain in the butt, but. <clears throat> yeah. Can you just, in the background, just send me a couple examples of that. Uh, this will also require me to like brush up on my skills in that area to put something together. Um, but it would be, it'd be a good learning exercise. So um, that would be really helpful. Sure. Um, let me make sure I know your email address. It's just. Uh, jmertick it? at linuxfoundation.org. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I have to drop for another call, unfortunately. Yeah, me too. Cool. All right. Thank all you right. all. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.